What's up, what's up, Instagram family? Hello, Truther team. Welcome. I'm Amy Rose Rewilding. I'm a holistic lifestyle coach and a yoga and movement teacher. And uh, today we're going live again with Tom. And today we're going to be talking all about wellness and healing, gut healing. We're going to be answering some of your questions that you've sent in. And then if there's time, we're going to be answering, answering some of your questions at the very end. So I'm just going to bring Tom on right now. Connecting through in cyberspace. Hey, Tom. Hi, Amy. <laughs> How's it? Good, good. So um, as some of you guys uh, already know, um, Tom is also a holistic lifestyle coach. We've both studied under Paul Check in the Czech Institute. And um, something else we have in common is that we've both healed from our own health conditions and uh, well, through unconventional means, applying uh, the principles that we've learned and also experimentation and exploration with ourselves and also with our clients. Uh, we're now able to live a fully embodied life, one of vitality and, uh, and total wellness. So I thought we would chat today. You always have some really great perspectives on healing, some perspectives that, you know, you, you really help me think in a new way. And so I thought it'd be great if we just chat about that here in front of our audience. So, um, yeah. yeah. So to start off, where would you like to start? Well, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people ask about gut health and gut healing. So it's probably a good place to start. Um, you know, I think it became fairly popularized and well-known maybe somewhere around 10 years ago, a lot of people started coming out saying that the gut is like a second brain and that a lot of our mental and emotional um, ailments are actually from dysfunctions in the gut. So it's looking at dysbiosis of gut flora, which are uh, affecting the ability to produce hormones properly and then therefore affecting moods and energy and um, the quality of, of life. So, you know, that's been, I guess, more well known over the last several years and more people are talking about it, more people are doing it. But I think therein is part of the problem where there's a lot of information out there and 90% of it's probably not, I guess, uh, that helpful because it's one of those things that once something gets popularized, everybody starts doing it, everybody starts talking about it, and then you start finding heavily conflicting information and you're not sure where to start. You go through a lot of protocols and cleanses and things that might you know, do more harm than good in some cases. So I think it's good to chat about this and, uh, you know, talk about the things that have actually helped in the real world and not just in, in theory. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with my own journey, um, as you know, I've dealt with, um, uh, really, really painful menstrual cramps. So, uh, hormonal menstrual cycle issues and also hormonal acne as well. And, uh, I had to start my journey in the gut as well. And uh, I would say that the thing that really helped me the most was understanding that subtracting was the most powerful thing I could do. So subtracting the foods that were causing irritation in my gut, but also subtracting some of the things in my life that were contributing to stress. Um, you know, changing jobs, making decisions that, you know, will give me a better, um, a better mental mental space so that I could heal. So really yeah. subtracting, I think, is like one of the most powerful things, one of the best places to start, to understand that when you have a, a wound, say, you know, you fall and scrape your knee, if you continually scratch that every single day, it'll never heal. So, you know, removing certain foods and um, understanding what foods are really irritating to you personally and for the most part, yeah. I think it's it's pretty standard across the board, the specific foods that you would want to eliminate. But curious your thoughts on that, on subtracting. Well, did you do, um, were you using like an elimination or a rotation diet the way Paul teaches? Is that how you subtracted? Um, what I did was I had an IgG food sensitivity blood test done, and I found out what foods were um, really causing my immune system to have a reaction. So I eliminated those foods. Um, at the time, so I was... Like was that like gluten and um, what, what were the foods? Uh, the highest ones were peas, which is a legume, um, lentils, wheat, yeah, gluten, 
um, uh, what else was there on there? Uh, hazelnuts, uh, yeasts as well. So, um, so yeah, so I, I eliminated all of those and, um, and started to just really take time to really calm down. And, uh, and so those two things together were, were really powerful for sure. But it was interesting yeah. because I was vegan at the time and my diet consisted mainly of beans, grains, legumes. And those were the things that I, I had to really stop eating in order to heal my gut. Yeah, cool. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, that's, there's a lot of ways that that makes sense, but um, we can, I guess we can get back to that a bit later on. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, similar thing, but I basically just use Paul's rotation diet. So um, these tests that, you know, the IgG test, that's really helpful. I think for some people though, they might have to pay for it. You know, if they don't have medical insurance or depending on what country they're in, it's like not necessarily free and that can cost hundreds of dollars in some cases. Yeah. So the free version of that is to use um, the rotation diet, which is where you eliminate foods based on a four or five day cycle. So essentially you're eating to foods in their genetic uh, type, which is in Paul's, if you haven't read it, this book, how to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy by Paul Check. It's a really good book for just getting the basics right. And uh, there's a section in that that teaches you about the foods and genetic types, and you kind of just eat to those on specific days. And that gets you familiar with if you get flare-ups of different symptoms, whether it's digestive symptoms, uh, energy, emotions, uh, you know, whatever, acne, things like that can flare up based on whether, when you're eating things that don't agree with your biochemistry. And so you can start eliminating those on a four day, four or five day cycle because that's how long it takes the body to process the byproducts of those foods. And um, that's a really effective method to do if you don't have, you know, the ability to or the means to, you know, get um, blood tests and things done. But, you know, it's always, like you said, most of the foods are pretty, pretty common. You know, you've got, um, you got your wheats and glutens and things like that. That's kind of a... Uh, that varies though, because there's a difference between eating genetically modified, uh, you know, commercially produced crops and grains, as opposed to eating ancient grains that are grown organically and things like that. Like it's not, it's just night and day. They're not even the same food. So to say that you are just intolerant to wheat or gluten in general is uh, you have to really be eating organic and natural foods first before you start to then say, I don't do beetroot or I don't do, bread or I don't do whatever because that's uh you're just dealing with the chemicals and the, and the unnatural genetics in the foods if you're not eating natural and organic foods in the first place so that's I guess for me that's the first place to start is to when you're eliminating foods you still eliminate all the crap that's just not natural foods and then you can start to refine your diet from there right yeah definitely like um you know not only uh these genetically modified grains and uh, the glyphosate that's um, that's coming in with those grains as well, but really, really bringing your diet down to whole foods, you know, getting rid of that processed stuff, all of those emulsifiers, thickeners, dyes, um, preservatives, all of these things. Like, you know, I used to think that you know almond milk was healthier than dairy. I used to really think that dairy was basically poison. You know, for I was for a very long time when I was under the vegan spell, as I say. Um, and, but you know, almond milk, these, it has like 17 ingredients in it, you know, thickeners and emulsifiers and things like that. So uh, it really was a big shift for me to start to understand what whole foods really truly does mean. And to take a, a front, front role in, in cooking your own food and just understanding like, okay, I, I need to be in the kitchen uh, more than I am right now, making sure that I'm, I'm cooking the best food possible for myself and taking the time to source, as we always talk about, taking the time to source the highest quality food that you possibly can. And that, of course, takes time, you know, and we do what we can where we can. Yeah. Yeah, it's important not to beat yourself up about not getting everything perfect. You know, you don't have to have it perfect. It's just one step at a time. And as long as you're moving in the right direction, your thoughts and your energy are going towards creating a healthier life and a healthier body and a healthier internal environment, you're, you're winning every day. You don't have to be like, you know, you don't have to eat like you and I do immediately. It's just, it's a journey. You know, we didn't get to where we were in one day, 
you know, it took a lot of time, it took trial and error. And I guess that's one of the reasons we're doing these lives is because not everybody has to do the same trial and error. We can, you can kind of learn from our experiences um, as well. I think, um, you know, what's funny though, is that there's, when you talk about almond milk, this is a really good example because uh, it's just learning to differentiate between the subtleties within each topic itself so with almond milk it's not necessarily that almond milk is bad you can make your own almond milk and it's good you know it's not to say avoid almond milk because it's then you got to learn how to make things yourself which is good because it teaches you a skill and it teaches you more about yourself teaches you more about food and then if you can't be bothered making it that's really teaching you something about yourself because you go hang on if i can't be bothered making my own almond milk like what's that saying about my motivation to be a healthier person so everything can teach us about who we are and I wrote in my book, Common Sense Guide to Food, I said that if you try, if like some of these things are in the shops for ages and if you make your own almond milk, it doesn't last that long. It goes rancid pretty quick. And even if you put raw honey in, which does preserve it, you're still only getting a couple of weeks out of that at most. So then you've got to ask yourself, well, what percentage of actual almond milk is in almond milks in store-bought cartons? And is it ultra, you know, ultra pasteurized? Is it, is it just a completely dead food? But it's marketed as a health product when then, you know, we think we can buy health from a store <laughs> and health isn't normally something you just buy. It doesn't come with convenience. It comes from uh, a concerted effort to uh, be a healthier person. So uh, yeah, you know, that almond milk is a good example because it just shows where the marketing side of it lies and where the reality of it lies. And the reality of it is that you take the time and effort to do things mostly for yourself. That's not to say that there aren't people that make decent quality almond milks, for example, or any other product for that matter. But it means that you really have to put some effort into finding out, you know, how legit their product is because a lot of it is not, a lot of it is a business. And then there are small boutique kind of like people generally just, they work on their own and it's the only product that they do. They probably have a good product, but you're going to have to search those out. Yeah, absolutely. I love supporting those smaller companies. It always feels really good. And, you yeah. know, there, there aren't 17 ingredients on those uh, almond milks. There's only like one, two, maybe three tops. Yeah. 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 So you spoke about the, um, the gut being the second brain. And Paul Check talks a lot about how food is information. So I'd love to hear your thoughts if you wanted to uh, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, okay. So the reason it's called the second brain is that there are, there are more neural connections. And the same as, I mean, Paul teaches this in his scientific core conditioning or scientific core training course, I forget what it's called. But the amount of neurons that are there around the core and the, uh, the abdominal cavity, it's just, that's why it's called a second brain. There's actually more networks there than there are in the brain and the spinal cord. So it is where a lot of our processes get regulated, our hormonal production and, um, you know, our ability to digest and our ability to live comes from there because if we don't digest and assimilate properly through the gut, then the, the rest of the cells in the body don't get nourished at all. So it's hugely important part of our physiology. Uh, as far as, yeah, food is information because as far as we know, the things that we know about, there's so much more in this world that we don't know than what we do, but the two greatest carriers of information that we know of are light and water. So our food... Food doesn't come out, obviously, out of package. It's either grown on the land or it comes from an animal. So they rely on light sources and then water sources. So the quality of the light and water sources that have gone into the food affect the quality of the cellular structure and the information that is encoded and stored in the cells of the animal or the plant. So we then ingest that. And then accordingly, we can only operate to the level of the information that is coded and stored in the cells and the energy that we bring in. So it's hugely important to bring in high quality sources of uh, food because it is literally how our body is recognizing the nutritive value, the, uh, the energetic value and the, and essentially what to do with things. When our body doesn't recognize something that's high quality, it can't use it very well and or will create a reaction to it, whether that's an inflammatory response or something else. It's usually a negative response or an effect. So, um, you know, uh, you know, water is, I think, a, a really good example. And you do a really good Australian accent. I'm going to get you to say water soon. <laughs> you do it really well. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, uh, but it's, 
you've got to consider that water is finite in the world. As far as we know, we're still drinking the same water that dinosaurs drank. It just, there's a finite amount and it gets compressed, it gets evaporated, it gets frozen, it passes through countless organisms so that it carries a memory. It carries like a, a, uh, a structural memory over time. So if we bring in something that has a structural memory, say of being in a water plant for however long it's been processed and beaten out and the life is essentially beaten out of the water, that's a lot different from having something that is uh, like alive, so to speak. I know that people will say, well, how can water be alive? But it's more of the energetic imprint that is in the water and the memory that it carries. So that then carries into our bodies. It communicates with the water, the intracellular fluids that we already have. And it either strengthens us or weakens us. Very rarely does it, is anything just neutral. It's either benefiting us or it's detracting. So everything that we take in and all living foods are around 70 to 80% minimum water, sometimes higher, 90%, more, 95, 96% in some foods. That's the, that's the content. Even the foods that seem solid, like meat, that's still around 70 to 80% water. So again, it's just highlighting the importance of the quality of what we're bringing in and the information that's coded in that. Yeah, definitely. Um, Paul Check says that um, if the food you eat is more dead than you are, then it takes from your vital life force to bring it through your system and out again. So if what you're eating is, um, you know, a packaged something from the grocery store, some kind of packaged frozen food, it's going to take from your life force to move it through you, as opposed to you getting nutrition and vitality from it. Um, something that I love that Paul Check really helped me understand about meat, um, because like I said, um, I was vegan, I was vegetarian for three years, and then vegan for two and a half years. Um, and now I am predominantly uh, animal based eating now. And uh, when I was vegan, I would consider meat like a piece of meat to be dead i would say that that you know that was flesh and i didn't want that in my body because it was dead flesh and um but paul check really was very pivotal in helping me to um, turn that around and really understand and, and look at red meat as vital life force um you know especially obviously if it's fresh and and to see the life force from that animal and to see it as biologically appropriate protein that can be readily assimilated and can become you and become part of you and, and, and how truly vital meat can be. So I don't know if you have any sort of thoughts on that, on um, yeah, like seeing food differently or um, food as information, if you wanna just kind of keep going on that. Yeah, sure, all right. Uh, yeah, okay, that's it. Could talk for ages on that, uh, which I won't, but <laughs> the, uh, all right. First of all, with the freshness, yeah, something that's fresher definitely has more vital life force in it than something that's like not so fresh. However, there are a lot of processes used and you, you know, a lot of people know now that a lot of the wisdom in the world comes from the ancient ways. It doesn't come from anything modern. So what a lot of cultures have done is to age things like meats and vegetables and they'll like an aged meat or high meat can be extremely vital to the point where you can only take in a small amount because it's the energy in that is like medicinal. It's a medicinal dose. So you can't bring in a large amount of that at one time. So there's, it's a, there's a lot, there's a lot of give and take in that as well, but generally yeah, fresh, fresher is better, obviously. So um, for, for the viewers, high meat is um, something that has has gone rancid or fermented. Is that would that be an accurate description? Pretty much, yeah. It's it's in a it's in a specific state of bacterial uh, decay. So high meat is something that is being it's a process to create it. So it's a process of various stages of bacterial um, breakdown within the meat. So what that does is it changes it very much changes the energetic properties, but it's essentially just getting super high bacterial content. Uh, the reason it's called high meat is that it stinks, <laughs> but also because it, it gets you high, like it lifts spirits. It's a, it's a well-known uh, tonic for depression and depressed states and uh, can make you feel just elated for a, a fairly long period of time. So it's, uh, it's what a lot of cultures have done. Firstly, to preserve their foods when it wasn't plentiful, but also to encourage high 
amounts of bacterial content for either spiritual uh, journey purposes or for just your health health purposes, the gut health in particular, especially if you've gone through something or you've ingested something or you've been through a lot of high stress in a particular situation, then the ingestion of high meats, um, same with other types of fermented food. It's not really a ferment, but it's a, it's a similar process. So these foods are taken into a completely, uh, I guess, balance out and or increase gut flora. So um, that's probably a good topic to go into the flora, but did you want me to talk more about the, uh, that whole thing about the energetics of food or do you want to move on? Um, well, whatever you think, whatever, whatever is on top of your mind. Okay. Well, so first of all, just, I guess to continue on that for a, a second, uh, like I eat basically all of my food raw that includes meats as well. Reason being is that they're the energetic and the nutritional value of foods in their raw natural state are so much higher than they are when they're cooked. It doesn't mean to say that cooked foods are bad and you should avoid them and you should, you know, <laughs> it's like vegans when you were vegan, you know, a lot of people could take something that's an extremely healthy food, such as let's say raw cultured butter. And then if you ingest that and your mind is telling you that it's wrong, it's really bad for you, it's a poison, you, your mind is creating stress chemicals and your gut is creating, more specifically, the gut is creating the stress chemicals. It's triggered from the mind, but it's, uh, it's happening in the gut. So you are turning a food that is very healthful and completely diminishing its value to the point where if you're really sure that it's poisoning you and you're hating yourself or you're hating the world, you'll turn that into a poisonous food. So uh, the mind and the gut have a very uh, important connection when it comes to what we get from our food. And that's why when we eat, it's important not to be distracted. You know, a lot of people just eat in front of the television they don't give, they're not grateful for their food. They don't really experience the, the flavors or the, uh, the feelings that it gives them. And that's why a lot of people are disconnected from their food. They don't have that deep connection to it. And uh, that's a big topic by itself, the connection to food. But uh, the other thing about raw foods is the, the amount of enzymatic um, action that raw food has in the body is far superior to cooked foods. And, um, especially when you, it depends on the food. You're obviously not going to eat raw legumes or raw beans or raw wheat. You know, you just, you don't do that. But when it's a natural food, like your uh, meats, eggs, dairies, things like that, they're much more important to eat raw. You can still eat cooked foods like rices and things like that if there is a need for them. So again, I'm not saying you don't eat any cooked food. Uh, I'm just saying that in general, if it's a natural food, you want to eat it raw as much as possible because, you know, it just maintains and retains so much more of its its value. So um, what did I say we we're going to move on to? <laughs> that was some other topic. So remember, um, <laughs> well, um, you know, you said, you said generally eating raw foods is best, um, but there's also something to be said for cooked foods, uh, especially with someone who's in a really dire state with their health and with their gut. Um, a lot of things like um, something as simple as apples could give someone a reaction uh, if they're very, very, very sensitive, right? If they're if they have leaky gut, um, and if they're they're feeling um, really a lot of effects from raw foods, um, you know, all of the uh, anti nutrients in foods like um, I believe it's oxalates in broccoli, uh, lectins in tomatoes, uh, and these are the the plant's defenses. Um, and for those that are in a really dire state, you may need to eat more cooked foods. Um, yeah. But of course, then you lose some of the enzymes and the nutrient content as well. Yeah, everything, everything's a balance and every food, no matter what, when you analyze it, you could find evidence that it's a poison and evidence that it's an elixir. So that's every food. So it's really important. I, one of the things I always encourage people to do is not to eat with their mind. A lot of people do that. They, they convince themselves about a certain way of eating. These foods are bad, that food's wrong, this is right. And it's this whole psychological mess of eating disorders is essentially what people create for themselves. So um, for one person, an apple might be, uh, you know, the best food in the world and another person, it might be the worst food in the world. It's very, it's very individually specific. And then at some stage in your life, a cooked apple is better. And at some stage of your life, a raw apple is better. So not to confuse people, but it's, um, you know, that's why I guess it's, you can hire somebody as a coach to help you through this, because if you don't know, 
which stages relate to what. But generally, if there's nothing really wrong with you, I don't recommend changing much. There's like, there's kind of no point. I've seen so many people make themselves unhealthy by just deciding they were going to get healthy, even though they were pretty much fine. And then followed some dogmatic religious way of eating or lifestyle regimen and made themselves sick and they weren't sick in the first place. So there's, there's that to consider as well. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess um, moving on to the gut flora, which was where I was going before. So things like fermented foods and high meats, they are good. There's also, again, though, a lot, if you overdo fermented foods, you can overdo certain acids and you can get a dysbiosis the other way in your gut and it's not, not good. So again, it's always a, it's a balance, but generally speaking, if people have gut issues and, and anything that is going wrong that they think they can relate back to the gut and the health of the gut, I think uh, the gut flora is an important place to start. So Maybe we should cover some basic ground then. <laughs> so you've got your uh, the quality of the gut itself. So how is this, not the structure, but how is it functioning? Is it, uh, are the cells functioning optimally? Are you producing the right hormones? Are you absorbing food properly and everything like that? So that has as much to do with the integrity of the cellular structure of the GI tract as it does with the amount of bacteria that populate that tract. So you're kind of coming at it from a few different angles. And, you know, you mentioned leaky gut earlier, Amy, and there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are really common today. It's from bringing in too many processed foods, too many poisons that are in the body, too many uh, poisonous thoughts, which is stress. Too much of that erodes the integrity of the gut itself and then can also at the same time reduce the amount of healthy flora that are in the gut. So maybe we'll just talk about that. So for you, you know, in your experience, what have you found to be, you know, the better ways to start, I guess, increasing the efficiency of the gut and making sure that that flora is in a good balance. Um, yeah, for me, um, would have been uh, re removing those foods from my IgG uh, food sensitivity blood test. So mainly beans, grains, legumes, and wheat. And then, you know, coming to terms with eating meat, um, chicken, eggs, fish, and eating things that I could digest easier. Um, so it wasn't that I couldn't ever eat those beans, grains, and legumes again, but just for a time being in order to allow my gut to heal, but just eating really easy to digest foods. Uh, and they were generally uh, animal-based foods. And um, so as I um, started to heal, I came across um, this particular probiotic, which is a spore form probiotic, so also known as soil-based. Um, and these are commensal bacteria and they're influencer strains as well. So basically what, um, what that's mimicking are um, the little bits of uh, spore form soil-based probiotics that our ancestors would have gotten from, you know, eating food from the garden, being outside more than you, we are today. And um, so uh, these, these probiotics are interesting too, because it really opened my, my eyes to some of the myths in the probiotic world, like all of those probiotics in the, in the refrigerator and how they're supposed to be better and they're more expensive and those are the ones that you should have. But really, you know, once you put that spore in, you know, or that probiotic into your body, it just, it, you know, in 98.6 degrees, it dies, right? So these probiotics, they don't need refrigeration and they are spore form probiotics. So it's really um, mimicking how our ancestors used to uh, populate their guts. So I found that one to be just really, really helpful. Um, and then... Uh, doing a little bit of fermented foods here and there as well. Um, I did have to stay away from yeast, so I was making kombucha a lot, and um, I had to stop doing that, and um, I found actually some relief. I think I was drinking too much kombucha. <laughs> as you say, yeah. you know, you can, a any food can be um, detrimental, in, you know, in, in, if you overdo it, and, uh, and, and so, yeah. Um, and it, it was a slow process, you know, it takes time. Uh, and stress, right? So really, really taking a look at how I was managing stress and adding things into my life like um, work in movement where um, you're doing yin type practices like really gentle yoga, tai chi, doing these things that really stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. 
to sort of take over and calm down and, and just help you have a better mental and emotional state. Uh, because really, it's, it's all about our mental and emotional state. Like you said, you know, if I could put a percentage to it, when it comes to healing, I would say like 65% of the, of the struggle is, is getting a hold of your mental and emotional self management and, and, and fixing that and then, you know, the rest is, uh, is diet and lifestyle. So, yeah. yeah, so that those would be the steps that I took to, to help heal. And now I can have gluten from time to time. You know, I, I have like the spelt bread that has no yeast and, uh, you know, it's not very good, but, you know, it, it does once in a while, like when you're craving um, bread. Um, but really, I, I just started to get used to not having grains and and beans and legumes. And, and I love the way I eat now. I'm, I'm happy about my diet and I'm happy about the food that I eat. So that's, that's really big. Yeah, for especially yeah. for the mental, emotional state, like you said. So there's, um, yeah, and this, I guess, is a good bridge into that topic of there being, you know, there's, I, I just, the more I've seen it, there's no, for me, there's no foods to just avoid it, other than just processed stuff, obviously. But, um, you know, I've seen a lot of people do very well eating a lot of gluten, for example, um, a lot of, you know, uh, sourdoughs and things like that. I've assessed them and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. There's completely fine. But what you find is that the worse you are metabolically and the worse you are with your health, the more metals and things that are in the body, the more uh, reactions you're going to have. So quite often these reactions that people have, they're not a genetic reaction. They're not like you are born this way and you can't handle dairy or wheat or fruit or whatever it is. It's based on the level of toxicity in the body that is affecting the receptor sites in cells, especially in the villi and the digestive tract. And then a lot of other processes in the body, they're affected heavily by environmental toxins and poisons. So as you get those out of your body, you start to handle foods a lot better. And generally your metabolic dysfunction, your level of toxicity go hand in hand. As you start to get the toxicity out of the body, your metabolic capacity increases. And that's why when you see some people that are, you know, are healthy and they just throw whatever in their body, it doesn't matter. And their body just kind of seems to burn through it. They don't get reactions. They don't get constipation or diarrhea. They don't get mood swings. They don't get acne. They don't get gas and bloating, they don't get these reactions from food is because their body processes it. It doesn't mean it's good for them, but it just means that the body is, the body isn't this fickle, like, um, wallflower, you know, the, the body is highly adaptive, highly intelligent. You can, you can really do a lot to it and it can, it can come through the other side. The, the difference is that can it do that for a really, really long period of time? You know, you're talking decades, you can't treat it that badly. But at the same time, it is very adaptive and it's very resilient. So if you're in that state where you're not resilient, it's because of the underlying toxicity. That is what is keeping your body from being able to handle stress and of any kind. So um, as you said earlier, it's as much an important part of the process of healing the gut to alleviate your mental, emotional stress and to find ways to deal with that, which I think we've already spoken about in another life, which is things like... Uh, you know, making sure that you've got creative pursuits, making sure that you have some kind of dream, some kind of goal that you're working towards. Um, you know, just surrounding yourself as much as you can with things that dilute stress with whatever that is for you and particularly getting time in nature and uh, making sure that you are on point with your uh, cycles, you know, like day, day night, sleep, wake rhythms, things like that, not living outside of nature's rhythms. So things like that can go a long way to making sure that you're not excessively stressing yourself and therefore, uh, you know, compromising that the GI system and, and your, uh, your ability to produce the right hormones and things like that. So, uh, you know, realistically, I think what we're doing is getting back around to the idea of balance. If we're balanced, our stress levels are low. If we're balanced in the way that we eat, we're making sure that we're getting enough nutritive value and we're not, you know, putting undue toxins and things in. And there are definitely situations where people will need to take fairly, I don't like the word extreme, but fairly uh, disciplined protocols in order to get over a hump. And once you're over that hump, things become a lot easier and you can get back to being a bit more balanced with everything. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, balance is the key. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it does. It does take a little bit of time. And, um, 
but you can absolutely get there. Yeah. Um, so let's see. What What is one of the other questions that you received this week? Um, I had one about I had one about bars. I'll come to that in a second. I'll just quickly say that when you were talking about spore forms of uh, probiotics, that's one another one of the reasons that I eat a lot of raw food is because you are getting a lot of these uh, the natural forms of bacteria and what you'll call probiotics in just you're taking them in naturally because they're they're part of the food. It's also why if I can get fresh eggs, I won't wash the shells, even if they got poo on them. That's actually beneficial. It's only in the last, I don't know, 50 years, we've started getting this insane kind of thought in our mind that we have to sterilize everything, you know, <laughs> we have to scrub every surface, make sure it's super shiny. And but back in the day, nobody did that. There was like, if you, if you think about how much, fecal matter must have been going around from a lot of different things from having goats around sheep, horses cows um you know even each other even humans you know that's that went a long way to populating the digestive tract there's two things people are really scared of e coli and salmonella both are extremely necessary biota for proper function of the gi tract you just if you've got gi problems it's probably you've actually got a lack of e coli and or salmonella they're, they're very important so to overly sterilize what we're doing to overly cook food to overly clean everything and not to bring in things like dirts fecal matter and whatever else is gross that might sound to the modern mind that is how our bodies have traditionally maintained their strength health and vitality so uh yeah i'll leave that one there as far as other questions yeah i got one one guy was asking about the bars the hot bars so there's a few different ways you can do the hot bars one is you have it as hot as you can possibly stand. So that has an effect of putting the body into an extreme fever state. The reason that we, our bodies create fever is to accelerate healing. That's why we have fever. It's not something that we should suppress. People have, many people have died when doctors have prescribed people fever suppressing drugs. They've died because the fever was there for a reason. They think, oh, the kid's hot, they're burning up, let's give them fever suppressants. It's not a good idea. You need to let that fever run its course. It's there for a reason. So what some people do is extremely hot therapy and they've used this in certain cancer clinics where they will put a patient in a bath that is as literally as hot as you can stand. You know how you, there's only a certain heat you can stand on your skin. It's like literally burning your skin. So as hot as you can possibly get and you can't stay in there for long. So I've tried a lot of times you hyperventilate you. Um, it's extremely uncomfortable. And they'll actually physically hold the patients in the bath while they're thrashing around trying to get out until the point that they decide they'll, and, and what, what it's doing is it's, it's essentially giving this effect of getting deep seated chemical toxicity out of the body. And that's why it's extremely uncomfortable. The less uncomfortable way, because you can only do that for a certain period of time. That's not, a, that's not something you can do for, you just can't handle it. You'll actually pass out or you'll go into anaphylaxis or something. Uh, that's probably a good point. Don't try to push that one too hard. If you want to do the extremely hot one without medical supervision, that's why they do these in clinics with supervision. They can, you know, put you on resuscitation or whatever if necessary. So the way that I do my bars, occasionally I'll do super hot ones, but generally I do what's called a lymphatic bath. That's having the temperature between 39 and 41 degrees centigrade which is whatever 101 maybe Fahrenheit. I don't know, you have to look that up, but you have that for 45 minutes to 90 minutes. However, however long you can stand. Wow. I can't stand 90 minutes. It's just too long. I do about an hour and uh, that's as much as I can do. <laughs> I used to, when I lived with my girlfriend, we used to sometimes bathe together or she, she, after a while she knew not to come and talk to me while I was in the bath. Cause I just had just no patience. I just was not a nice person. I mean, it's because of the processes that are going on. So what that does is that's a lymphatic bath. Now the lymphatic system is extremely important. It, it does more, it does as much as the circulatory system of the blood. It carries nutrients. It, it sponges toxins. It carries information, does a lot of different, has a lot of really complex processes in the body. And it's very important to keep the lymphatic system moving and clean. And when you do lymphatic baths, it essentially, uh, 
breaks down, especially some of the stored plastics, which actually get stuck in that system. So it melts them down. That's why you have that at that specific temperature. It's a round fever temperature. That 40 degrees centigrade is where you'll get to if you have a temperature. The reason it's different from a sauna is that when you're in a sauna, you can you constantly have your sweat wicking heat away from the body and uh, like air wicking heat away from the body. It can't be wicked away while you're in water. It keeps the temperature constant inside of your body. So the reason you have to do it for longer than 45 minutes is that 45 is the minimum for that process to start happening. Those plastics won't be broken down and come out through the skin, which is essentially where the lymphatic system is going to drain um, unless you are in for that long. And that's one of the reasons why it's also extremely uncomfortable is because that's, it's just not a nice process. And most people will get what's called a scurf rim around the bath. If you're in there for long enough, you'll actually see, it's not sludge, but it's like there's a definite lining around the top of where the water is in the bath. And even in the porcelain in the bottom after you drain it, you'll see that there's stuff that you actually have to wipe away that's come out of your body. So that is, that's things, that's your environmental toxins and plastics and things that are stored as residues in the body. That's them coming out. So that's why the baths are very important. There's a few things you got to do with a bath too. I like to put salts in. I either put Epsom salts in for some extra magnesium, like you spoke about last time. And I think somebody wanted to know how you make your magnesium drink. So we'll talk about that next. And, uh, or I do a mixture of sea salt and uh, bicarb, which is essentially a compound that together helps to draw radiation out of the body. Or I'll do, or, and or I'll put in some um, bentonite clay, which helps to draw toxins out. So I'm really lucky. I've got rainwater here. It's super clean. If you have town water, you probably want to treat the water. So that means having apple cider vinegar in the water that can help to break down some of the chlorine and, uh, and the toxicity and probably put some clay in before you get in the water. So if you put apple cider vinegar and some bentonite or some terramin clay in the water five, 10 minutes before you get in, that helps to pull some of the toxic gunk out of the town water so that you don't absorb it into your body. Once it's arrested in those things, they don't let it go. Clay holds on really tight. So it's just, it won't come out of the clay and into your body. Oh, wow, uh, you can use... Sorry, yeah, that's that's a great tip because I've not wanted to do uh, a lot of baths because I don't have um, a, a bath filter just yet. I'm still working on that. Um, but that's really great to know that those compounds, apple cider vinegar and bentonite clay will, will hold on to those things. So you can have a safer bath. Um, yeah. The upside of vinegar doesn't hold on to it. It helps to break some of it down. The clay is what will hold on to it. So if you can get a good quality bentonite clay or a terramin clay and you put, you don't need much. It's like half a cup in the bath that will help to arrest the toxins. So just make sure it's like dissolved in the water and leave, leave it five minutes before you get in. That gives it a chance to pull, to draw the things out of the water and to hold on to it. And then it'll just be washed down the sink after you, uh, after you bathe in it. That's the other thing you can do is wee in the bath. As long as you're not like, <laughs> as long as you're not taking chelating agents and things where you've got specific metals and things coming out of the body. If you wee in the bath, it's actually really good for your skin. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in the urine if you're relatively healthy and you can do that too. Okay. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I've, I tried one of these really, really hot baths and um, it was really intense. It was hard for me to stay in. I think I stayed in like maybe 20 minutes and I, and I was like, I have to get out of here because I might pass out. Um, so, yeah. you know, and I also didn't know, like, you know, I, I tried to submerse my, my upper torso and, and try to, you know, because I guess majority of our lymph system is, is in the upper half of our body. Um, so is that what you suggest? You suggest to be like submersed right up to. Yeah. Good point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, really good point. I missed that. So that's, you do need to be as submerged as possible. So um, sun baths just aren't going to allow that. So what I suggest is to like slide into it as much as possible. So even if it's a shallowish bath, you've got your genitals, your groin, your armpits, and up you're up to here in the water. Um, sometimes you just can't handle it. I can't, like every now and then I'll just come up so that I'm up to like just below my chest and I'll make sure my legs are submerged and I've got my head and things out and I'll just cool off a bit. I might get a damp towel. So what happens is if you, one of the reasons it's hard to stay in the water is that your brain heats up. So if you can get something that cools the brain, which means putting like a damp cloth over the head or an ice pack or something on the head, it helps you to tolerate the heat a lot longer uh, and having maybe some, um, you know, refreshing drinks or something there to help 
keep you relatively feeling cool, but it's not going to affect your core temperature. Uh, but yeah, definitely as much under the water as possible. And when you are feeling like you can't handle it, just come up for a bit. There's another thing you can do. <laughs> so one of the, those methods are keeping yourself submerged for as long as possible. Now, if you really can't do it, one of the other beneficial ways of doing hot bars is to do your hot and cold therapy, which if your bathroom permits is to have your bath till as long as you can handle it and then go and take a cold shower for a minute and then get back in the bath for another 10 minutes, go take a cold shower for a minute. So you're doing that hot, cold um, therapy that forces the vascular system to contract and to, you know, to dilate and track and to, to do that. It really pumps things through. A lot of people in a suppressed state have problems with their biological pumps and they're not exercising enough or properly and they're not getting things moving through the body the way they're supposed to, the lymphatic and the circulatory systems. So hot, cold therapy can help you to do that as well. That's a really beneficial process to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, yeah, I'm definitely going to try that. I'm going to try to do all the way to 45 minutes next time I do a really hot bath. But yeah, it was really intense. I'm not, I'm not used yeah, to Yeah, not really hot. Don't do a really hot one for that long. That's your lymphatic bath. That's the 39 to 41 degrees. To keep, okay. it temp to keep it hot. So I'll let you know how I do that too, is that the bath, because if your body's at 37, which it's supposed to be, and a lot of people, if they're metabolically uh, deficient, they're going to be more like 36 or even 35. If you get into 40 degree water, for your, as your body heats up, it doesn't just heat up for no reason. It's drawing heat out of the water. So the temperature in the water comes down. So you've just got to keep monitoring. I use, I don't have it down here. I use one of those digital thermometers that costs like $3 from a chemist or from eBay. And I just pop, it's like that you use in cooking. And so I just pop that in the bath, in the water next to me. And when I feel the water cooling a little, I'll check it. As soon as it gets down to around 39 degrees, I um, turn the hot on for another few minutes to bring the temperature back up to 41. Then I turn the hot off and then, you know, let it come down. In the winter time, I'll have to do that probably three times, you know, two or three times. In the summer, I'll still have to do it once to keep the, uh, to keep the water at that temperature. So you will have to um, monitor that unless you've got some epic bath that somehow holds the heat in. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you generally have to keep topping it up. So that's another reason not to overfill it at the start because you'll need to top it up a couple of times as you take the bath. But yeah, don't run it too hot. 41 at the most, because if you go over that point, you start to have, it has a different effect. You're not having a lymphatic bath anymore. So just choose what you want to do. You either do a lymphatic bath and keep it 39 to 41 degrees for that time or you do a really hot bath. You don't like mix the two up. Okay. And how often would you suggest someone to do um, a lymph lymphatic bath for detoxing? Mm -hmm. A few times a week, if you can, that's, um, uh, <laughs> you do, okay. So a few times a week, if you can, that's kind of normal without assessing somebody. I have no idea. Some people can't do them for more than 10 minutes. So if you're in a weak state, I'd say don't do the baths because your body needs to be able to process what's going on. And also this is a topic we can handle another day because it's going to be a long one, but fat, fat is protective. A lot of people like I'm literally trying to put on as much weight as possible at the moment. I'm like, most people are completely the opposite. They just want to get as ripped as possible, but I naturally stay quite lean and it's not my, my metabolism is quite high and I naturally stay lean. And it's not good. It's not, it doesn't facilitate healing. Fat is not only a place where toxins are stored, but it's very protective. It allows the body to be stronger. Generally, really um, um, lean and people that are really lean are often quite weak and frail. I'm not talking about genetically um, gifted athletes. I'm talking about general people. And people with a bit more fat on them are a lot stronger, a lot healthier, a lot calmer in their emotions and their, their mental state. So uh, unless you've got a little bit of extra weight on, I don't recommend doing uh, heavy detoxification protocols like the hot bars for extended periods of time because your body won't handle it. It'll, it'll weaken you or you'll feel really bad after it. It'll take you a long time to recover. So I try to do around three baths a week, three to even four or five if I can get the time in to do it. And I feel like paying the gas bills <laughs> and I've got enough water in the tank because it's rainwater. So there's a lot of things that you know come into play. But um, you could do them every day if you are at a stage that that is okay for your body. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing them every day. But for some people, it might be once every two weeks. 
The reason I say that again is that let's say you and I are talking about this and we say you should do four bars a week. Now, somebody that doesn't have access to being able to four bars a week might then say, well, I'm now compromised because I can't do four bars a week. Now they get stressed that they can't do that. Now they're going to make themselves worse. So even if you did one bath a month, that's still fine. That's like, and even if you can't have a bath, it's not, it's not the only way you're going to get better. And it's not the only way you're going to increase the efficiency of the lymphatic system. You can do free stuff like rebounding. You can do, um, there's plenty of stuff like even self massage. You can do lymphatic drainage on yourself. You can do, you do heaps of stuff. Even, you know, like various forms of yoga and exercise without doing the lymphatic specific stuff, that's still good for the lymphatic system. So mm-hmm. um, there's a lot you can do for that. So yeah, it's like, I say three to four a week is good if you're in a heavy detox, but I don't think you should think that that's what you have to do <laughs> right. to be Great. well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be adding that to my protocol for sure. Um, yeah. Something that you brought up there is a subject that I love. You talked about how having a little fat on your body is a good thing. I mean, I think our bodies would prefer always to have a little bit of fat, even though we, you know, we see really lean bodies all the time, you know, and, and that's sort of what we should strive for. And that's, that's how we should look is just really lean. Um, you know, while that is, you know, really appealing, our body would always prefer to have a little fat on it. And in fact, when you, um, when you're healing, uh, sometimes you'll put on some weight, you know, and, and those are kind of considered the healing pounds, right? Um, and we've talked about yeah. that a little bit, right? And so sometimes you even go through stages where um, you've put on a little bit of weight, um, but you're, you're going through another sort of healing level. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because you want to establish health first before you lose weight. If you lose weight in a really stressful way, uh, by restricting whole macronutrients or restricting carbs like crazy, you know, you're going to end up being stressed out and you might lose weight, but you'll do so in a stressed out way, which will have a cascade effect on your hormones and just cause a, a, you know, a whole mess and, and it'll affect your mental and emotional state as well. So, you know, he, health must be established first before healthy weight loss can occur. You know, you, you need to, um, yeah. You need to be healthy in order to lose weight. So I was wondering if yep. you could kind of speak a little bit to that. You really seem to have some good perspectives on that. Yeah, I've had people who, okay, there's no right and wrong. For example, there was, I used to know this girl, like we were friends more than anything. Oh, she was a friend of a friend. And anyway, she had cystic fibrosis and I visit her a couple of times in the hospital and I told her that there's ways that she can bring that mucus production down. Uh, If anyone doesn't know what cystic fibrosis is, it's like an overproduction of mucus. It can clog the lungs and you can stop. You have to go and get your lungs drained like a tube in your mouth and all that sort of stuff. And it affects a lot of different parts of the body, but it's mostly an overproduction of mucus. And I told her about the, the ways you can actually bring that down and live naturally without having to go to hospital and things like that. She had a look at what it would take and she just said, actually, I don't want to do that. I'd rather just come into the hospital every now and then and not do what you've, t- what you've said I should do. <laughs> and because she never whinged, I was just like, I respect that. That's cool. I'll still come visit you in hospital or <laughs> whatever. And um, because she wasn't whinging about it. She wasn't saying she wished it was different, but not doing anything. She just said, no, I'm, I'm making my decision. I'm fine with this. And I completely respect that. And the same as when people, when it comes to things to do with weight, um, I think it's important to realize that there's this huge societal pressure, like you were saying, to, I guess, look a certain way. And there's also a fine line there too. I'm not suggesting anyone gets obese. It's obviously not healthy. <laughs> the thing is, okay, you know, here's how I can, here's how I can define this. This is, it's really simple because I'm actually putting this in my new book actually at the moment as well, is that if you are eating a completely natural diet and so everything is from the earth, uh, it's an, or it's just, it's just natural and it's organic. It doesn't matter how much of that stuff you eat. If you're say, I don't even like to talk in pounds, but let's just say relatively speaking, you're 20 pounds overweight, like whatever weight you think is normal. There's no way on earth that's, that's unhealthy and you can't get obese from that. It's like literally impossible. You would have to, it's actually impossible. Even if you tried, I don't think you'd get obese 
if you are just living a natural life. It's literally impossible. So whatever weight you carry is what your body needs at that time. So uh, to the point where I'm really trying to limit the amount of activity that I do so that I can try to increase my weight to a, you know, as much as I can, because I'm still eating a lot of cream, a lot of butter, a lot of eggs, uh, a lot of meats, you know, a lot of everything that people consider fattening, but they're not really that fattening because you have to, the degree to which you would have to overdo that you physically can't put that in your mouth. It's like your body knows your body just talks to the food, you know, but your body can't talk to processed food. They can only talk to natural food. So as far as the, I don't know, is your question more along the lines of appearance and looks or is it along the lines of health? What's the question mostly? Um, well, both. I, I like your perspective on both, you know, um, but you had said that, you can't really detox or you have a harder time detoxing if you don't have enough fat on your body. You can't. Yeah. It's impossible. So I took a patient to one of the local environmental toxin, uh, environmental poison, whatever clinics, the guy was charging a lot of money there. And one of the things that I asked the, no, I asked my girlfriend at the time said, tell me, tell me what you see about all these patients coming and going. And she couldn't pick it because we we're made to wait there for like an hour. And I was like, just what's something about their, their appearance. Tell me something about their appearance. And she was like, after she watched about 10 people come and go, she goes, Oh, they're all really skinny. I was like, yeah, they're all, they're all really skinny. That's why they keep coming back. None of these people are going to get better ever. And um, if they're that skinny, their body has no reserves. It will, will not allow the body to let go of the embedded environmental toxins without the fat to protect it. So what happens is that when I put people on protocols where they need to gain weight, they'll gain it and they'll need to hold on to it for around two to three months. Once they've held it for that long, that's long enough for the body to relax in its systems. And then when they then let the weight go, the toxicity goes with it because it's stored in the fat cells. So um, they might need to do a few periods of that, of gaining a little weight and then losing it. As you shed the weight, you shed the toxicity and then gaining the weight again and losing it, but not in the same way that a bodybuilder or figure competitor does because that's damaging to the metabolism. If you're doing it just the way you need to with foods, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't damage the metabolism. Like, I don't know if you've seen that before, but when people do figure, com women especially, because your hormonal systems are much more delicate, if you go through periods of weight gain and weight loss, but it's done through deprivation, that's like pushing against the grain that it's pushing against the fabric of being really hard and you can push it. You can get to any body fat percentage you want, but that's really pushing hard against the grain. And eventually that's going to push back. And what happens is because you push so hard, it pushes back the other way. And then each time they try to enter another competition, it's harder and harder to lose the weight to the point where it just will not, they could starve themselves. They can exercise 10 hours a day. They can do whatever they want. They can take whatever pills they want. And the weight just will not go because the body just won't allow it. The body's metabolism has busted and it's not going to allow itself to be put into that situation that, because that's like the death to the body. It won't allow it. So that's why people that have been athletes that have really tried hard to keep a really low body fat percentage later in life, they just have uh, metabolic syndrome. They, they literally are chubby for the rest of their life. They doesn't matter what they do. But if you do it the natural way properly with foods and things, you can gain and lose weight as much as you like. doesn't affect your, your metabolism because your fat set point doesn't change. One thing that's really important about fats, going back to some of the diet, one of the reasons that I eat fats raw. Um, so cooking carbohydrates isn't such a big deal, like rices and lentils, whatever. But fats, I try to, well, I keep, and I recommend other people keep to eating raw. So things like uh, your eggs, meats, and especially oils, um, butter, cream, uh, olive oils, things like that. What happens is when you cook and heat a fat, the molecular size can increase anywhere from 10 to 50 times. So if somebody eats only raw fats and they're at, say, let's say 25% body fat, they will look way leaner than somebody who eats cooked fats who is also at a 25% body fat percentage. Reason being is the molecular size of the fat molecules just increases when it's heated and cooked. So that's one of the other reasons to have more raw fats in the diet. Not only do they help arrest toxins, they're superior to any other food as, as far as their ability to do what the clay does and arrest toxins in the body and move them out. But from a uh, aesthetic perspective, somebody that eats raw fats is going to look 
fitter than somebody who eats a lot of cooked fat. That is so fascinating. Tom, I can't believe we only have like a couple seconds left. I wanted to let you finish your thoughts. <laughs> Guys, we're going to come back with more of these videos.